country, and, and that even though they live there, they are not Zionists. Uh, but what changed a lot of opinion was the Holocaust. The absolute horrors of the Holocaust, two out of every three Jews in Europe slaughtered. Some of these large ultra-Orthodox communities that were anti-Zionist slaughtered. Three million out of 3.3 million Polish Jews, nine out of every 10 Polish Jews killed. That this changed some of the sentiment and other rabbis recognized we do need a homeland. And others had been saying in advance, hey, this is part of the Messianic era. In other words, we begin to come back and then the Messiah kind of takes it from there and finishes the work. So many, many religious Jews today do recognize the modern state of Israel as God birthed and part of the, the harbinger of the Messianic era. But there are many others who do not, and those are the reasons for it. Kevin, thank you for the call. 866-34-TRUTH. We will be right back. You know, we can have an endless debate on the question of have you lost your salvation? Can you lose your salvation? I don't even like to phrase it like that because it gives you the idea. It's like a pen. I, I, I misplaced it. Where did I, where did I put, where did I leave my keys? Our salvation is not something little like that. You just lose it. The question is, can I forfeit my salvation? I would encourage you to do this. Rather than focus on that question, and I believe the answer is yes, you can forfeit your salvation. Let's look at God's promises to us and major on that. And he says this in Romans, the eighth chapter. At the end of the chapter, he says this, for I am sure, Paul writes, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Messiah Jesus, our Lord. God will not force you to stay in his house. God will not forbid you from leaving. God will not say that you cannot walk away from him. He will not take away your freedom of choice. You can choose to deny him. You can choose to walk away from him and pursue a life of sin and say, I reject you as Lord. And he will not force you to, say, to, to stay in the home. And he will not force you to walk in obedience. But unless that's your heart and intent, and you intend to deny the Lord and walk away from him, don't major on that. Instead, if you want to follow the Lord, you're his child, major on the promises that he promised to keep you. So be warned if you think you can walk away from the Lord without consequences, but be encouraged. Nothing can separate you. Be encouraged. There is no force outside of you that can separate you from the love of God. That is how tenacious his love is set on you. Major on that. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on The Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. What's happening just six days from now? April 14th, what's happening? Ah, that's it. Yes, National Not Ashamed of Jesus Day. This is all about you and me telling the world on this particular day, we're here we're not ashamed. We love Jesus and we love you. We're not hiding in the shadows. We're not avoiding the truth. We love you. We're here to share Jesus. Let your light shine on that day. You say, well, what specifically can I do? Go to notashamedofjesus.org. Notashamedofjesus.org. It'll give you plenty of ideas. If you're a pastor or leader, it'll give you plenty of ideas. You can still share it with your congregation on Sunday. Get the word out social media. We've got lots of churches, lots of networks joining in to do this. We believe it's a great way to push back against the cancel culture, a great way to push back against the silencing of the lambs, a great way to push back against this attempt to marginalize us and muzzle us. This is a day in particular where we, we get the word out that we're here. You may find out there are many other believers in the workplace or in the school that you didn't know about. It may open a door for you to share the gospel with others. So make sure you go to notashamedofjesus.org and post that on social media today. Would you, if, if you feel good about it, 
join us in doing that. All right, seems that we are back uh, with our video on the screen and our audio on live stream. If it's not synchronized correctly, it's always a new challenge. It's amazing. But here we are. Hopefully everyone can hear me loudly and clearly. All right, let's go back to the phones with Jennifer in Colorado. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Yes, hello. Hey. Hi, thank you so much. I have kind of a complicated question that I wrote down to write to ask more sufficiently. So um, I know that many people have kind of guesses of what was written in the sand with the woman that was to be stoned in John chapter 8. And there is a verse in Jeremiah 17 that refers to those who reject the hope of Israel. Their names will be written in the earth. But... The, it goes on to say that they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. And that's kind of the reference that gets me questioning a little bit more, because in John 7:38, which is just the previous chapter, it says, you know, that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Right. And my question is kind of twofold. Could this refer to, um, to also Jeremiah 2.13? <laughs> um, it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And the real meat of my question is, that: do, is it possible that that reference could be during the festival of Sukkot, because the broken cisterns that hold no water refer to the water libation ceremony and the fact that that wasn't Torah? Or is it even possible that Jeremiah would be referring to that ceremony? Okay, uh, it's unlikely that Jeremiah is referring to the ceremony. The image okay. of God being a fountain of living water is, is simply that it's an image. Uh, he presents himself, if you look in Jeremiah 2, in many, many different figures. And he is, he is a husband to Israel, which is a strained wife, and there are just other, other ways he mm-hmm. presents himself. So in a society where, where living water, which means uh, just generically is, is running water, is free-flowing free streams and things like that, so for God to be the source of that, the fountain of that, uh, the imagery is very clearly understood. That's why in John 4, as Jesus is talking to them about living water, she doesn't get it initially, because Mayim Chaim would just mean running water somewhere. Like as as opposed to a stationary right. well, a stream, and he says, "No, no, I'm talking about something spiritual." So in John seven, when when he when he then says, "If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink," that's in conjunction with Sukkot tabernacles and the water procession that they'd have daily, where where the priests would be walking uh, towards the temple with these massive jugs of water. So that's what sure. he's contrasting. As for tying in uh, the end of John seven into John eight. That that's as fascinating as it is in Jeremiah 17, perhaps you know tying in with the writing in, in the earth and all that. That would be the most speculative part because the, the earliest manuscripts sure. of John do not have John 8, 1 through 11 there. Uh, that passage huh. is in some one early tradition is found in the Gospel of Luke, and in others is just an independent tradition. So it doesn't seem that in the earliest mm-hmm. copies of John that John 8, 1 through 11 was actually there. We do believe it's scripture, but as to that exact location, uh, it, it's debatable. As to the meaning of Jeremiah 17, um, it, it's interesting. The, the, um, uh, the New Jewish Publication Society translation uh, says, uh, those in the land who turn from you shall be doomed. And then it explains it uh, saying uh, literally inscribed. And the meaning of the Hebrew is, is, is uncertain, but it reads it differently. It's those in the land who turn from you shall be doomed. And I'm just looking at it. Um, it, it doesn't talk about writing something in the dirt. So uh, it just, just the Hebrew does not speak of that. So I don't believe that, that whatever Jesus wrote in the dirt, that it would tie in with uh, Jeremiah 17, 13. The Hebrew is definitely speaking about something else being inscribed in, in the earth, your name's written or something like that. Some, some signification of doom and judgment. All right, uh, back to the phones. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's uh, hang on. Let's go to um, Michael in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hey, Dr. Brown, how are you? Doing very well, thank you. Um, so I just have a quick question. So recently I was baptized, and 
I was I was praying silently to myself while the pastor was talking. So um, firstly, I didn't hear him say in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So um, I don't know if it was said at all. And secondly, um, I didn't verbally confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior um, just because I wasn't asked and I also didn't know I was I was supposed to. Um, is the baptism valid or... To, to, I, I couldn't find anywhere scripturally where people were ever rebaptized. So, Right, so when you were baptized, uh, was it understood that you were doing this to make a public profession of your faith? Yes. Right, so the purpose of your baptism, there were other people there as witnesses? Yes, the whole church. Right, so the whole church knew that you, Michael, were making a public profession of your faith, that you were a follower of Jesus, and your life belongs to him, Correct. Uh, yes, I would assume that that's what they thought, yeah. Right, okay. Well, then, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Uh, all right, thank you so much. Yeah, oh, also, yeah. can don't, I ask don't... a follow-up question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, does it does it matter if um, people are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or if it's in the name of Jesus Christ? There are people who try to claim, Jesus-only people, who try to claim if you are not baptized in the name of Jesus, it's not valid. Uh, that position is to be rejected. The, the clear teaching in Matthew 28, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and in the earliest traditions we have in the Church, that's how it was done. You say, well, is it invalid if I was baptized in Jesus' name? No, I don't believe it was invalid if the, under, the understanding was the same, that this is a public profession. I, I've died to sin. I now live to God. I go under the water, and I come up in, in newness of, of life. That's what baptism is symbolizing. And people would point to the book of Acts I do believe that the book of Acts should be understood in the light of Matthew 28 and that people, the, the Greek prepositions are different, being baptized into Jesus or into the name of Jesus or upon the name of Jesus. Some say the, the person being baptized was, was calling out in the name of Jesus and they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Some say it means being baptized into Jesus, into the body of Christ. But if someone said, hey, I was baptized in Jesus' name, do I need to be rebaptized? I would tell them no. And all the more would I tell them, no, if they say, well, I was told I had to be baptized in Jesus' name. I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Should I be baptized again? Absolutely not. However, if you were baptized as a baby and then came to faith later in life, I would say absolutely get baptized. Because what happened to you as a baby was not determinative and was not based on your profession of faith. And the New Testament is clear. Repent and believe. Excuse me. Repent and be baptized. Believe and be baptized. So in that case, I would say the first baptism doesn't count because it's for an infant. You should be baptized once you come to faith. But be at peace, Michael. If, if you were asked, if you were asked to make a public profession and refused, no, I'm ashamed, then it wouldn't be valid and you wouldn't have been baptized. But you just went along with the, the, the right as best as you understood it. Hey, Michael, thank you for the call. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Taylor in somewhere. I just noticed I don't have a location. Where are you calling from, Taylor? Uh, Woodland Park, Colorado. All right. Well, welcome to the broadcast in Woodland Park, Colorado. Thanks for the call. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Michael Brown. I appreciate you taking my call, and I just appreciate your ministry, uh, everything that you're doing. And um, about three weeks ago, you actually had this on the broadcast. Uh, you were talking about um, just what it takes, I guess, for people to be born again, or like, how do you know you're saved? Um, and I know you've touched on these related issues of like somebody who submits to JDS, which is Jesus died spiritually and born again Jesus views. Um, so my question is, would that person be saved um, if they, you know, believe something like that? It's like. I guess I come to, like, the uh, verse that's found in Acts 13. It's, like, verses 30 through 36, where Paul was concerning Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And then he quotes Psalm 2, You are my son, today I have begotten you. If you could touch on that just a little bit. Right, so there, there are a, a couple of different subjects there. But the second one, I know you're relating them as one, but they're, they're really separate, the idea of, quote, Jesus dying spiritually in hell or being born again in hell and then being proclaimed as God's son. 
this is a public proclamation. Romans, Romans 1 is indicating to us that the resurrection is God's public proclamation of Jesus as his son. And Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. It's not saying he became the son of God there because he was born again in hell. But I'll come back to your question on the other side of the break. Stay right here. You know, I used to hear this verse from my pastor, and it's something that's stuck in my mind. And now in the Lord, as I record this video, going on 49 years and preaching since 1973, and it's now 2020, preaching since I was 18, now 65, I can attest to this through personal experience. So first, let me read these verses from the Psalms. Very, very interesting passage. And it says this in Psalm 75. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. And the saying is that promotion comes from the north. Now, in, in Canaanite mythology, Tzaphon was the mountain of the gods. And Tzaphon also means north. So the north, the mountain of the gods, that's where blessing came from. And then the Hebrew Bible takes that and takes away the myth and, and makes the north basically looking up to, to God and saying promotion comes from the north. Promotion comes from God. That's what it's saying, not south, east, west. It comes from God. My friend, I want to assure you, if God has given you a job to do, if he's put a calling in your life, if you feel burdened to, to speak, to act, to serve, you know there is a role for you to play. God can open doors that no one can shut. Jesus says that to the believers in Philadelphia, even though their own strength was weak. In, in Revelation 3, I'll open a door no one can shut. Friends, I, I am an eyewitness. People said, unless you do it this way, this way, this will never happen. I said, well, I, I have to honor the Lord. And unless you play this game or that game or meet this group or do it this way, I'm sorry, I have to honor, well, that door will never open. Or you'll never preach here. Or you'll never do this. Or you'll never do that. And I just said, you know, I have to honor the Lord. I have watched him connect me supernaturally. I have watched him open doors. I have watched him get messages out. He has burdened me with things that I didn't tell anyone. And I prayed about and prayed about for years, or maybe told only my closest circle, my wife, Nancy, prayed about. No one knew about it, but I knew God was speaking to me. I want you to do this. And then I pray and I know someone's going to come to me and initiate the process and say, I want you to do that very thing. And the day I journal it is the day they come to me. I've seen these very things happen. I've watched God open doors for me around the world. So be it in the workplace, the promotion you deserve, be it recognized among your classmates, be it a ministry situation, nobody knows you, nobody recognizes you, everybody takes credit for what you do. God knows, God sees. You honor him in secret, my friend. You live a life consistent in his sight. He will raise you up. Remarkable. This is how we rise up. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks so much for joining us on the Line of Fire. Phone lines are wide open. 866 348 
844 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. Any question of any kind that relates to anything we ever discuss on the Line of Fire broadcast, by all means, give us a call. Okay, so we did a, a teaching a couple of weeks ago and asked, what must we believe about Jesus in order to be saved? In other words, can we just say, well, I think he's a good moral example, a human being like everybody else, but a good moral example? No, obviously not. Well, I believe he's the last of the great prophets, but clearly not the son of God. Can you be saved and believe that? Obviously not. How can you confess him as Lord if that's what you believe about him? So we tried to lay out the, the minimum foundation for what must be believed to be, for someone to be saved. So what about this teaching that Jesus went to hell, right? So not, not only died on the cross, but went to hell. Well, there is discussion about Jesus going into the netherworld for various reasons. The New Testament talks about him proclaiming to the spirits in prison. There are ancient church confessions that speak about him, go, quote, going to hell. So that, to me, is not a disqualifying issue to say that, he, that, that between his death and his resurrection that he descended into the netherworld. What if someone said, we believe he suffered in the netherworld? as opposed to he simply took the wrath of God on the cross, but he suffered in the netherworld. That, to me, is going to be much more debatable. Some would say, well, Psalm says that the, the, the pains of death couldn't hold him, so he was suffering on some level in the netherworld. Okay, that is not going to be more controversial. And some would say, well, no, that's all part of the cross. That's all part of him dying for us. So do we draw the line there? If someone says... And this is the, some of those bizarre teaching I've ever heard, and I've heard it in some extreme word of faith circles, that Jesus died in hell and became a demonized human being and was resurrected as a son of God. That's heresy. That is outright heresy. Now, if someone says, oh, no, no, he paid for our sins on the cross. This is just what happened in the netherworld. It's still heresy, okay? You're, you're teaching something false. Can someone who holds to that be saved to me, it's heresy. It's very plainly heresy and a denial of his eternal deity, that at some point he ceased to be God and was now born again as a glorified man. That's heresy. If someone is confused about that, but says, no, I believe he died for my sins, and that's the heart and soul of it. He died for my sins, rose from the dead, but this is what I think happened in the netherworld. Okay, you throw that out. Okay, it's dangerous. Throw it out. I'm not going to say you're not saved if you're confused about that, but if you think that that's fundamental to the atonement. And in particular, if you teach that at any point Jesus ceased to be God, that's heresy. Rank heresy. That's simple. And must be categorically rejected in the clearest possible term. Hey, thank you, Taylor, for raising that question. 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. Let's go to Bill in Cape Coral, Florida. Welcome to the line of fire. Cape Coral, sorry, Florida. Welcome to the line of fire. No, actually, Dr. Brown, you had it right the first time. Cape Coral. All right, so I grew up here in Cape Coral. That was just our New York mispronunciation. There's only one R instead of two, but it's just west of Fort Myers in case you know where that is. Yeah, yeah, Fort Myers. I've been there many a time to minister. Good friend there, yes. Okay. All right, well, my wife and I just moved here as part of our retirement. We've been following you for several years now in our torchbearers. Thank you. And really... uh, thrilled to, to, to make, make use of the resources you have made available to us. What my question is now is, <clears throat> the church that we've affiliated with, I've just learned that they don't uh, make members of anybody who comes here. There's no differentiate between being an attendee or a co- member of the congregation, and there's no member policy. And they said, because it's not biblical. So I'm wondering, based on your you know, expertise with the ancient Greek, is that biblical or not? Okay. I understand arguments for and against. One of my closest friends says church membership is not biblical. It's not a matter of the nuances of the Greek. In other words, you can get the exact same understanding just reading the English. The argument would be that to have a membership that is based on, okay, you, you tithe or you do this, you attend this number, of, you know, all of these other requirements— that's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is you become joined to a fellowship of believers. In other words, the, the standard 
of commitment and fellowship in the New Testament is very high. And people can attend and just go there, but if they are really organically part of the body, they are, they are organically part. They are deeply joined together. Now, personally, I find church membership practical because you are saying to people, hey, we would love to make a deeper commitment to you as leaders if you feel to make a deeper commitment to us. In other words, if this is your home, then we feel the sacred responsibility to care for you. Uh, for, for example, if, if you have uh, an emergency within your own family, somebody needs to, to be rushed to the hospital in your own family, and there's someone down the street that you met one time that needs a ride somewhere, it's like, hey, I'd love to help you, but i got to get my family to the hospital. You know, there's a, Paul says if you don't care for your own, meaning your own family, you're worse than an infidel. So many times people right. say, leaders say, hey, look, you're welcome to come here the rest of your life. Take in all the services, listen to the messages, send your kids to Sunday school. But if you want a deeper commitment here where we can be more involved in your lives, where you're financially helping with the work here and, 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 and we're working together for the gospel of the community, then church membership in that sense can be super practical. Those who say it's not biblical basically say that should be happening organically. It's not written on a piece of paper where you have a role. It's basically a spiritual thing in God's sight. So if this is where you go, this is where you give, this is where you serve, this is where you grow, just do it organically. And in, in churches that have that philosophy, there normally is that deeper place. In other words, it just, it just happens naturally, like a couple dating mm -hmm. that gets close and falls in love. It just happens naturally. So it wouldn't concern me if they, if they hammer it. Church membership is unbiblical, and this is a major thing they hammer. And you know, that can be okay. Why, why do you need to do that? But if they just say, hey, just become part of our family, we don't have a paper to sign, but we'll get to know you, you'll get to know us, we participate together, then that can be great. That can be fine. As long as there's that ability to go deeper together, that's the key thing. Yeah, I look at involvement in a church with three levels you've got the um, person who's involved, you've got the one who's committed and then the third level which is the most intense is truly engaged and um, I often use the ham and egg omelet example is that when you think of a ham and egg omelet the chicken is involved but the pig is committed <laughs> and when both of them come to you and say I want to be part of your breakfast that's engaged got it got it yes yeah, so so I'm the thing applied to yeah so the, the thing is though, those are those are great analogies, and the ham and egg, what I'll, I'll have to remember that. I, I don't only think in terms of ham and egg omelets, so I'll have, to, I'll have to remember that. But in point of fact, sir, as long as the church functions in such a way that those that really become engaged are engaged and the leaders are engaged with you, uh, that there is that deeper place of commitment, you, you can't find that, those levels that you mentioned, you can't find that explicitly written out in the Bible, right, in the Greek or in the English, etc. But on a practical level, there, there are those different aspects of being part of a body. So, no, I do not find the concept of, quote, become a member of a local church as something explicitly taught in Scripture. But I absolutely find the call to be organically, closely connected to a group of believers involved in their lives uh, under leadership, working together for the for God's purposes in that community. So hopefully that'll work out where you are. God bless you, Bill. Appreciate it. 866-34-TRUTH. Let us go to Dominic in Australia. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Uh, hi, Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, I just had a question about um, what, what, like, forms of entertainment should we avoid watching? Like, is it okay for a Christian to watch Harry Potter or or a trashy reality TV show? Like, how, how should we go about uh, what to avoid in, in the entertainment industry? Yes, uh, it's, it's a very good question. There are certain things that are personal choices because the Bible does not explicitly address it. There are other things where the Bible does give us very, very clear guidelines. Anything that pollutes us, anything that defiles us, any, anything that is displeasing in the Lord's sight, in other words, if I'm willfully taking in something that is destructive, sinful, obviously I've got to avoid that. 
I would encourage you to read through Ephesians 5, 1 through 16, and meditate on that, Ephesians 5, 1 through 16. Harry Potter, people will debate. Others say, no way, absolutely not. Stay away from it. That's sorcery, that's witchcraft, that's glorifying demonic things. Others would say, no, it's no different than like a C.S. Lewis book or, or Lord of the Rings with Tolkien or their spiritual images and their lessons to learn from it. And so let's just say there's a difference of opinion about that. There could be no difference of opinion about watching some X-rated movie or something that, that glorifies gratuitous violence or that uses profanity for entertainment and things like that. Those are defiling unclean. Now, I may be watching a documentary learning in history, and it's, it's got unsafe people, and they're using profanity. As I, talk. I don't like it, but I'm trying to learn something, and that's, that's the accessible information. But to be entertained by it would be sinful and wrong. You can ask the larger question, does this enhance my walk with the Lord or take me away from the Lord? You could ask the larger question, is this light or is this darkness? Certain things are very blatant. Others make those personal choices. I couldn't imagine watching trashy reality TV unless I was trying to learn what was happening in the culture, and I'd be repulsed and grieved the whole time. We'll be right back. How important is faith? It is absolutely, fundamentally important. Hebrews 11.6 says it succinctly. It says this, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, it's a separate question of how do I get faith? I, I, I want to come to God, but I'm not sure if he's real. That's a whole other question which deserves a lengthy answer in itself. But I just want to focus here on the foundational importance of faith. Whatever is born of God is written in 1 John 5, 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. How? We overcome by faith. We cannot come to God. Think of it. We cannot trust him. We obey him, follow him, do anything unless we believe that he exists. It has to start there. And this is not to beat you over the head if you're struggling with unbelief. Jude says, be merciful to those who doubt. But faith is absolutely fundamental. Just think, if you've ever been through a severe faith trial, everything falls apart. Your confidence falls apart. Your motivation for all that you do, it is a massive crisis. Is God real or not? Is this true or not? Is the Bible trustworthy or not? Did Jesus rise from the dead or not? We must be secure there. We must have faith as the foundation, and then we build everything else on it. You're not going to cultivate intimacy with God. You're not going to get involved in outreach. You're not going to try to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord if you're not sure about who he is. So if you're struggling here, you're going to struggle in every other way. And it may seem an odd thing to do if you're struggling with even believing in God. But take the little bit of faith inside you and say, God, I want to believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus will be merciful to you and meet you there. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us today on the Line of Fire. Remember, April 14th, six days from now, if you're watching, listening live, National Not Ashamed of Jesus Day. Go to notashamedofjesus.org. Spread the word. We've just got six days to get this out. It's our very first year doing it, so it's just getting started. But we believe this is something that could be greatly encouraging and lead to a lot of great evangelism on that day. Not ashamed of Jesus.org. All right, we go back to the phones. Marion in Detroit, Michigan. Welcome to the line of fire. Dr. Brown, how are you doing? This It's actually Marlon, but how, how are you? I'm doing um, great. Yeah, I, I apologize. It's probably typed rightly, but my eyesight missed it. Thanks, Marlon. No, yeah, no problem at all. Dr. Brown, what do you think of the Bible Project? And secondly, I saw a video pop up that was criticizing it, and I was thinking, what's a biblical approach to, if you disagree with someone, do you put out a video 
against their video. What's the approach? But the first one is, what do you think about Bible Project? I just wanted to get your opinion. Right. So it's it's become mega popular, got millions of, of downloads and views online, from what I understand. And as far as I can tell, the few clips that I've watched, it's only a few. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't followed it my cl- more closely. We're, we're pretty mainstream in their teaching. You know, I'm, I might have diff- <clears throat> differed with a, a nuance here or there, but from what I could tell, it seemed to be fairly mainstream. I, I remember mm-hmm. hearing some criticism. A friend was filling me in on it, and they were, I don't know, considered to have a wrong view on a certain subject or liberal or wolf, yep. right? yeah, w- whatever that was. The few videos that I watched were just basic Bible stuff in a good animated way and a simplified mm-hmm. way presenting overviews of books or key themes, etc. But I, I have not dug into it. So if there's more to it, if there are legitimate questions, I'm not aware of that. All right. From what I saw, it was pretty much meat and potatoes kind of stuff. So let's mm-hmm. just say, though, that here's the Bible Project and video comes out on a particular theological subject and it gets a half million views in, in three months, and you're a pastor and you're watching it, and you think, well, that's wrong. That's terribly wrong. Okay, what's the mm-hmm. right approach? You think, wow, a lot of people are watching it. Or one of my videos, and it gets 50,000 views. And like, wow, Dr. Brown's wrong on this, and he's, he's misleading people. That's what you believe. Okay, so if you have any connection to the people, if you know the people, if someone knew mm-hmm. me, the right thing is to contact me. If you know someone right. in the Bible Project, you reach out to them. However, you are not obligated when someone puts out a public position to go to them privately before you address okay. it publicly. They didn't ask for your permission when they put it out, right? So, uh, in other words, if it's public information, let's, let's just say mm. Rick Warren is, is on MSNBC doing an interview, right? Mm-hmm. And he says mm-hmm. something that... It's very controversial. And someone calls my show and says, hey, I, I saw Rick Warren say that. What do you think of it? Well, it's a public statement made in a public setting. Mm-hmm. So what a gracious way I'll interact. Boy, I think it was great. No, here's why I differ with it. Now, if I knew him, right, and I heard about it, mm-hmm. I would immediately reach out to him. Hey, Rick, what's going on here, man? You said such and mm-hmm. such, right? But w- when I write a book and I put out a position, people can write a whole book differing with me. That's fine. That's, mm-hmm. Have at it. It's, it's, it's public, right? Um, so it's different mm-hmm. than Matthew 18. If your brother sins against him, go tell him in private. This is not you sinned against me. I have to go tell you in mm-hmm. private. This is mm-hmm. you said something to a million people that I differ with, and now I, I want to protect my flock with that. So what mm-hmm. you, you want to do things with a right spirit. That's the key thing. Yes. You want to be fair in what you represent. You don't want to draw conclusions beyond what you're dealing with. In other words, this may just be one teaching that's aberrant. I'm not going to make a judgment on the larger thing. I'm not going to engage mm-hmm. in character assassination. But if someone says something right. blatantly false, then as a, as a steward, as a teacher, you, you want to fix that. You want to correct it. So mm-hmm. it's, it's perfectly mm-hmm. fine, especially if you don't have access to people. I, I'm, I'm a, a leader mm-hmm. with international connections, but there are people I've tried to get to it that they won't talk to me. I've tried to reach mm-hmm. out to them privately. Mm-hmm. And, and, and be gracious to do it before correcting them publicly, but they won't mm-hmm. talk to me. All right, well, I've got to deal with this publicly. I'm burdened to do it. It's an issue. I've got to help the people involved. Other times, there's another way to do it, which is just address the issue, right? Mm-hmm. There's controversy over this issue. I want, to, I want to do a teaching on it without saying brother so-and-so said it or it was this project. That's the other way to do it is just to correct the issue and, and deal, deal with the facts. But by all means, it's out in the public, public square. Address it. That's th- a fair game, totally fair game. All right? Thanks, Dr. Brown. You are very welcome, sir. All right, 866-34-TRUTH. And we go to John in Cincinnati, Ohio. Welcome to the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. How are you doing today? Doing well, thank you. Hey, I've got a question, because I was listening to you talk about church membership earlier. Yeah. And um, and I and I disagree to a certain degree. Uh, I'm Catholic, so and I've never listened to you before. But I was curious to you know we talk when we read read the Bible. It talks about Jesus founding a church. The gates of hell will you know not prevail against this church. Yeah. You know, Jesus is fully human, fully God. So he's physical 
uh, you know, so the church is physical and spiritual. So as a Protestant, and like I said, it's the first time listening to you, what's the, the reasoning for, say, being Protestant uh, versus being Catholic? Because I think, you know, the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus founded 2,000 years later. You know, the church is the church of the church. There may be a little disagreement, but the truth, the truth is the truth. So I was just curious your take on that and your, yeah, sure. your position as a Protestant. Yeah, yeah, sure. Very, very easy to answer. Uh, first, I was raised uh, in a Jewish home. We were not religious Jews, but I was raised in a Jewish home in Bar Mitzvah. And Judaism teaches that we have the Bible, but then we have the authority of the rabbis and that they are the, the mm-hmm. true expositors of Scripture. So you have the Bible plus tradition. That's how you understand the Bible. It's similar yeah. to Catholicism in that you have the Bible plus church tradition and the church is seen as the rightful interpreter of the Bible. We both agree the Bible is God's Word, correct? Yes. All right, so when I see church tradition violate the Word, or add to the Word, or take away from the Word, then I have to reject that tradition. So that's why I'm not Catholic, because I find many of the traditions to be contrary to the Bible, or adding to the Bible, or taking away from the Bible, and, you know, even forbidding priests to marry, I, I find that is utterly unscriptural and even contrary to God's principles and what's best. And, and that's one reason I believe you have as many scandals as you do in the Catholic Church is because of that unbiblical teaching about priests, nuns have to be uh, unmarried. That opens the door for all kinds of disaster. Or the exaltation of Mary, which I find very contrary to Scripture, or doctrines like the infallibility of the Pope, or uh, other aspects, you know, the, the, the nature of mass, purgatory and things, uh, I don't find is scriptural. So I, I have friends of mine who are Catholic and, and love the Lord, and as far as I know, are, are born again, and we agree on many fundamentals. But the church that Jesus is building, and let, if you're right, then all the, the Greek and Russian Orthodox in the world, they're not part of the real church. And the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of Protestants are not part of the real church. I, I see the church that Jesus is building as far bigger than the walls of a Catholic church or the walls of a Greek Orthodox church or the walls of a Protestant church or anything like that. I see them as far, far bigger than that. And, and it is a real body that he knows and he can identify those that are truly his. And in fact, it says in, in 2 Timothy uh, that the foundation God is building is secure, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, so he knows his true church, and let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So it's our turning away from sin. So what I'd encourage you to do is read the Bible afresh, and as you're, you're reading it, just see if there's something that it teaches that the Catholic Church doesn't teach. Put a question mark, ask why. Or conversely, if the Church is teaching something and you're reading a verse that seems to be contrary to that verse, mark that down. And, and then ask you, yourself the question, what has the great, greatest authority? Does church tradition have the ability to rewrite Scripture, to add to Scripture, to take away from Scripture, to reinterpret Scripture, or must the traditions of the church be tested by the Word? Hey, thank you, John, for the call. Uh, glad you're listening and tuning in. And let's get to know each other better through the show. I'm I'm sure there'll be a ton that we do agree on. Appreciate the call. Do I have time for one more? Uh, All right. I'm going to try quickly. Joseph in Washington State. Time is short. Dive right into your question, please. Hi, Michael. Hey. Hey. um, I want to share that, uh, and I want to see how you feel. Every, every morning when I wake up, I, say, I, I practice self-discipline. I say to myself, when I leave my house this morning, I will do a selfless act for another human being, for an animal, or for the earth. And so if I see a piece of litter on the ground, I pick it up, and I throw it in the trash, and I show, I show mercy to the one that threw it on the ground. And, and, and these are the things I do. And before I drink coffee, I thank my Heavenly Father for creating coffee beans. Then I drink my coffee. Before I drink my water, and we have two dogs, or Kelavim, and I feed them before we, my wife and I eat. So that way they know they're getting food. So this is how I walk in my life every day. And even when I go outside and walk the dogs and I see a squirrel or a bird or a deer or a bunny, I say, Joseph, you're on a run there. 
but I got to cut you off. I, I wanted to get to your question, uh, but let us glorify Jesus. And above all, let us share the good news. The greatest act of kindness we could do for someone is introduce them to Jesus. All right, friends, not ashamed of Jesus.org. Just got six days, not ashamed of Jesus.org. You can't resist us. You can't resist us.